Stanford University. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Shashanka. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about data infrastructure at LinkedIn. It's going to be a slightly broader talk than what we just had from Facebook. It's going to do a little bit of a whirlwind tour of all the uh, data-fueled products that we have and uh, all the infrastructure systems that we build to support these products. And I'll try to do a deep dive into a new system that we're talking about today called Espresso. So I've been uh, working on distributed systems in various forms over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, at the last, uh, last one and a half years, I've been at LinkedIn working primarily on uh, distributed data transport and storage technology. And uh, primarily uh, Kafka, which is uh, a messaging and stream, uh, stream processing system. Databus, which is uh, change capture uh, for uh, primary data stores and Espresso, which is a new uh, NoSQL store that I'll uh, talk about today. So I'm going to sort of go over uh, LinkedIn uh, in terms of the, the, the few products that we have that are uh, fueled by data, uh, the data ecosystem, how we make sense of where data fits and what the life cycle of data is, LinkedIn's infrastructure solutions, um, and I'll cover four of these, and then uh, what we're thinking of next, uh, what are the things we didn't cover, and where are we uh, going from here? So I'll start with the, uh, just a few numbers. We tend to have, uh, over the last year, uh, a phenomenal amount of growth. We've got uh, 120 million users and more. Um, more than uh, 4 billion people search as expected this year, uh, upwards of 7.1 billion page views. So it's a, it's, a, it's a large amount of data. And when you take that amount of data coming in from the front end, multiply it out by the amount of joins and the amount of derived data that you construct out of each of these activities, and then go offline into the amount of uh, data that you have to crunch through, it tends to grow up and multiply at each stage. So I'll start with you know, the most uh, well-known product on LinkedIn, which is member profiles. This is your you know, online professional identity. It's a pretty uh, simple application, but it has a pretty complex data model because your profile is you know, customizable, there are various sections in it. It's, uh, it has a pretty high active data set because a lot of views are happening and people are modifying their profiles as well. However, uh, it's a very online application. Once you modify your uh, profile, you want to see the uh, update right away. The next application we have uh, that's also interesting is Signal. It's a basically faceted stream search. What we are talking about here is uh, you've got real-time updates happening uh, on LinkedIn. People are updating their status. People who've linked their LinkedIn accounts with their Twitter accounts are basically bringing in the Twitter fire hose of updates as well. And we want to be able to consume this fire hose and be able to support search on the stream as well as faceting. So what we're doing here is applying a professional filter on top of this feed and allowing you to search for a term and then facet based on your degree, how far your uh, connection networks go. So I can facet by stuff that's only coming from my first degree network or my second degree network, or even drill down further into companies or software industries. So it's a pretty powerful application. And the last one uh, of these, sort of the three applications that I picked specifically for this presentation is people you may know. These are all the connections that we think you should have. And that is uh, essentially a large-scale graph processing problem where we walk through your entire connection graph and then try to figure out which are the other members that you might want to connect to directly and being able to rank those uh, connections and give you the top you know, 10 or 15 recommendations on the first page and being able to give the most relevant ones. That's a pretty hard problem. It involves you know, a large-scale data problem because you have to uh, take into account not only connections that exist today, but also any kind of implied activity that have, might have happened between people uh, that are not even connected, and then do a large-scale computation across all the members to come up with these result sets. But doesn't have to be done right away, which brings me into sort of the uh, next set of how we reason about you know, the data ecosystem. There are a bunch of other products that I didn't talk about for time, and also because these three products are fit very nicely into this uh, three-bucket paradigm of where we split the data continuum. 
you've got online, which is activity that should be reflected immediately, and profiles, member profiles are an example of that. Then there's nearline, so this is all the stream processing stuff that uh, Zeng talked about. This is activity that should be reflected soon, uh, stuff that's coming in from Twitter, uh, something that you did right now that I want to show someone else but doesn't have to be done right away. And then there's activity that can be reflected later. So being able to do a large-scale batch computation where you want to uh, sacrifice latency for throughput. And uh, people you may know is a classic example of uh, an application that fits into that model. So is that enough or do we uh, need to do something more? Well, uh, once you sort of split it up into your online, nearline, and offline, then you start asking questions like, okay, uh, if I'm building a data infrastructure toolbox and I've got my online data infrastructure, what are the capabilities that I need? Well, you definitely need key value access. A lot of applications actually fit that model. But you, you, once you start programming, you realize that, well, key value is good, but not great. You tend to do a lot of secondary stuff that you also need to keep consistent with the primary key. And you say, well, I need some richer structures. I want counters. I want secondary indexes. I want to be able to modify hash maps and lists. And uh, something that we at LinkedIn have actually found very uh, useful is the ability to have change capture coming out of your primary stores. Because if I have transactions or anything going on in my primary stores, then being able to keep my read replicas or derived data systems consistent, timeline consistent, with respect to the online data stores is a huge deal. Um, then, of course, once you grow to a certain amount of uh, data size and you want people to be able to find the stuff they just wrote, uh, you need to be able to provide search. When recruiters come to the website and they're trying to look for the exact candidate that they want to find, you need really good search capabilities. And once you have a graph, and that graph permeates through all your applications, and LinkedIn in particular has been uh, sort of very uh, particular about being able to attach uh, an ID to every user that you see to say whether they're in your first degree network or whether they're two hops away from you or three hops away. And that implies a, a, a phenomenal amount of complexity in your graph engine so that you can do fast graph uh, operations and you can do fast uh, set intersections. So we have systems in all of these. Um, we've got Voldemort, which is our uh, very fast and efficient key value store. Uh, we use Oracle a fair bit for our primary data stores. Um, we're working uh, on Espresso, which is a new system I'll talk about today that also uh, sort of fits the gap a little bit between fully key value and fully relational. On the search platform, we took Lucene and built a lot of tools on top of it. Uh, Zoe is uh, real-time indexing, Bobo is faceted search, and Sensei is a distribution layer similar to Solar on top of uh, these technologies. And DGraph is our distributed graph engine. Um, we don't talk about it a lot. It's pretty uh, interesting. Maybe we should do a talk about it someday. Um, by the way, these slides will all be available. Uh, so uh, if you're taking pictures, uh, all the slides are going to be available after the talk. All right, so online, uh, let's go into nearline. Uh, these are, as I talked about before, your change capture streams from the primary data stores. Uh, but then that's not all that goes on, right? I mean, you have writes happening to your databases, but you have a lot of other things happening, which are reads. Uh, someone comes into the website and looks at someone's profile. It didn't modify the database, but we want to track it anyway. And then there are uh, a bunch of other things like uh, ad impressions and ad clicks that also uh, tend to generate a lot of data and uh, need to get tracked and monitored and analyzed. Uh, the third thing is nearline processing. Uh, Puma uh, fits into that category. Uh, you want to be able to take all these streams and be able to aggregate them and uh, massage them and figure out what your uh, derived data stores and your derived uh, results are going to look like and do it uh, as close to real time as possible. So we've got uh, Databus and Kafka, which are our primary uh, change capture stream mechanism and our uh, messaging systems. And nearline processing, uh, we're going to do a different talk about it soon. It's a much larger topic. It's going to take up a lot of time, so I didn't spend any time on it this time. And then, of course, you have the offline ecosystem. This is all the machine learning stuff, the ranking that I talked about, uh, relevance. And uh, even stuff like business intelligence on top of how your features, features are performing, looking at revenue. And then, uh, then there's analytics on social gestures. Some of it can be done real time. Some of it you want to do uh, offline as well. And we use uh, Hadoop and Friends mostly for a lot of this. We also have RDBMS, of course, uh, uh, for some of the more complex and more reliable kind of uh, requirements. And uh, again, analytics, I'm not going to spend time uh, this time. 
So once you lay out the tools, it starts looking uh, pretty complex. This is, a, this is what a typical website that has some amount of scale looks like. You've got your online data stores, primary stores, messaging tier, distributed graphs, search, and then you've got your near-end processing stores, uh, processing layer, and your uh, offline bulk processing layer. So uh, what am I gonna talk about today? I'll just focus mostly on four systems that uh, sort of sit in the online and near line space. Uh, data transport, we've got Kafka and uh, Databus. And in online data stores, we have uh, Voldemort and Espresso. So I'll start with uh, Kafka. It's a high volume, low latency messaging system, uh, very similar to Scribe, which is what uh, was covered in the Facebook talk. But uh, it has a, some slightly uh, interesting de details and differences, I guess. It came out of primarily uh, wanting to track all the activity that was happening on the site and being able to process a voluminous amount of logs and data happening on the site and being able to generate monitoring data, being able to make sense of what's going on and even uh, uh, constructing derived data stores like uh, who viewed my profile and sort of analytics on your, uh, your own profile basically to, to sort of tell you what kind of users are coming and looking at your uh, profile. So it's a, it's a very similar architecture, I would say, to Scribe. You've got the web tier, lots of machines which are pushing events as fast as they can. Um, it tends, uh, I'm, I'm, these are mostly single node numbers. Uh, we tend to saturate the NIC most of the time. It's sequential writes to uh, disk. And uh, there's a broker tier with a bunch of nodes. And essentially, the, the API is send topic message, and a given topic uh, routes you to a given node, and then within that node, it's a sequential append to a file. On the consumer side, uh, we've got Hadoop, uh, we've got uh, sort of nearline systems that are all pulling. It's similar to the tail operation that uh, uh, mm -hmm. Scribe or Ptail uh, that, that Scribe has, where uh, consumers basically trying to pull events. Again, it's a very sequential pattern. You've got read happening, and it's purely uh, from the file system. In fact, we even skip the user space and use send file, so it's very efficient. And this is a wide variety of consumers. Uh, we use the same technology to move data into the offline space as well. Uh, in terms of scale, it's billions of events. We are moving a lot of uh, stuff from our older tracking system into this. So it's going to grow over time, as, and as engagement grows, terabytes per day. And we've, we see just a few lit seconds latency from um, our online uh, data stores to our replica data stores, uh, data centers, as well as uh, you know, our corporate, uh, corporate replica data centers. And of course, uh, to keep track of all this, you need Zookeeper, so topic management and figuring out, given a topic and a partition where it's located, uh, we use Zookeeper for this, and for consumers to maintain their checkpoints. So Kafka is a best effort, high throughput, durable messaging system. Uh, but for replication, you actually need very good consistency, you need uh, the ability to handle transactions, and you need really low latency, uh, sometimes even milliseconds. And so we have data bus, and you, you end up having slightly different design trade-offs that you make while designing these systems. So data bus is our system uh, that we use for timeline consistent change data capture. It basically um, supports uh, external clock and external commit logs, and being able to reason about them and transport them to downstream consumers. Uh, we've got adapters that we've written for both Oracle and MySQL, which are our most uh, primary data stores. And so as long as you have an Oracle data store or a MySQL data store, we can capture transactions and create these um, event windows which get, uh, which get uh, pushed into uh, or pulled into a relay cluster. So from a, uh, from a deployment perspective, you've got your databases and you have a tier of brokers or relays which are essentially pulling changes from the database into, their, uh, into a low latency in memory uh, path. And uh, you've got these online changes that are being subscribed to by uh, clients which are you know, being able to reason about where they are with respect to the commit numbers that are being generated outside the system. Replication systems have a unique uh, place because they can actually allow you to fast forward data by just snapshotting you uh, from, from like an older point in time. So you've go if you have a client that comes in and has no data at all, Instead of replaying you everything that happened since time zero, it's much more efficient to bootstrap you with a copy from like an hour ago and then catch you up with the latest changes. 
So Databus actually handles all this seamlessly by incorporating a bootstrap database, which uh, is also another consumer, but just supports this kind of uh, compressed delta operations on, on large data sets. So these are the two uh, data transport systems that we have, and we use them uh, in pretty interesting ways. And they, they sort of fit into uh, the way data gets moved from online data stores to near line and back again to the online and, and, and also into the offline space. That said, uh, I'll now move into the data store space. So I'll cover Voldemort. Uh, it was one of the first, I would say, uh, NoSQL key value stores, distributed NoSQL key value stores that was, I think, open sourced. It, if for fa people familiar with Dynamo, which was uh, Amazon's uh, shopping cart data store, and uh, recently Cassandra, it follows the same style model. Uh, at LinkedIn, we tend to deploy it in sort of a two-tier architecture where we have a fat client which understands, given a certain key, where the values are located and uh, does partition-aware routing into the uh, Voldemort cluster. The partitioning is very simple, consistent hash with ring, and given a certain key space, you have uh, a few uh, nodes that are responsible for that key space, and you use quorum reads and writes to get uh, tunable consistency. One of the things that's really nice about Voldemort is that uh, it's, it's a layered uh, architecture, and so you can actually swap out things uh, depending on your workload or your requirements. We've done that a fair, about, uh, fair amount. So um, one of the things we do for most of our online works, uh, workloads, we tend to use uh, BDB Java because it's log structured, so you can handle a lot of writes. Uh, but, but we have a lot of uh, batch computation that happens on our Hadoop systems, and then we push it online using these uh, read-only stores that we construct for Voldemort, and that has incredibly uh, high performance. So if you have you know, different workloads, you can sort of tune Voldemort to get the best bang for your buck, depending on what your workloads are. Um, so this is great, except uh, there are a couple of things that bother us. Uh, key value uh, doesn't work all the time. A lot of uh, applications tend to do large lists and then uh, having to deal with uh, list appends and pulling and keeping two key value pairs in sync gets to be a problem. Uh, for any primary data store, being able to get a replication log out of the system is very important, as I said before. And having an eventually consistent system uh, as your primary store makes that much harder. So um, uh, one of the things, for example, we are doing with uh, Voldemort is uh, uh, SSDs to flatten out the latency uh, percentiles and multi-tenancy. Um, but that, that sort of leads me into uh, some of the uh, stuff that led us towards trying to look for a middle ground. And Espresso is, for us, uh, fitting that sort of a sweet spot that our applications need between key value and uh, full relational. So in, in sort of one word, um, it's indexed, timeline consistent, uh, and a distributed data store. Um, and I'll cover the data model. And um, we are basically putting it through its spaces right now in production. Uh, this is more of a design talk right now. Uh, we, we'll probably get a lot of learnings uh, in the next uh, three to six months and be able to come back with a talk where we say, here's what works really well, and here's what doesn't work very well at all. So what are the things we did? Uh, the key design points are, um, we have a hierarchical data model. We found that uh, there are a lot of online applications that fit this very well. Uh, if you take email, uh, you have a mailbox, which is your top level uh, key, and then message ID, which is your second level key. Um, similarly, attachments, you have a attachment, you have a mailbox, and then you have attachments within it. Uh, take forums, groups, a lot of these have this kind of hierarchical models. And uh, we're trying to exploit that and being able to let the application uh, tell us that the, that the data model is hierarchical and take uh, advantage of the hierarchy. So what do we do with that? Well, first of all, we provide a native change capture stream that's data bus. This gives you timeline consistency on a per partition basis and allows you to reason out about read after write. So if you have a session, we give session style consistency. So if you have a session, you did a write and you want to do a read, we are going to be able to figure out um, how to give you a consistent read based on uh, what you just wrote. The next thing we were looking for really was uh, rich functionality within a hierarchy. So if I have a mailbox and I want to do complex operations within the mailbox, like 
uh, update three different rows transactionally, uh, we want to be able to do that. Uh, the other thing we realized was a lot of uh, a lot of applications need what we are calling local secondary indexes. So I might have a top level uh, mailbox, but within that I want to be able to uh, look for emails with a particular subject or uh, being able to do full text search within uh, a message. And the fourth thing is more of a design principle, which is we wanted to uh, take some of our uh, learnings from Voldemort and actually make the system modular and pluggable. So that even if we uh, make uh, a design choice that works well for a single or particular kind of workload, we can actually reuse the whole system and just replace one of the components to get uh, better performance for a completely different workload. Uh, off the shelf, we, we are using MySQL, um, primarily in ODB uh, as the storage layer because it's very reliable. Uh, and we're using MySQL replication, uh, some parts of it. And uh, we're using Lucene for full text search, Avro for storing and representing data, and uh, a little bit of uh, MySQL's transactional uh, capabilities for doing local transactions. So uh, here's an application view of uh, the mailbox application that I was trying to uh, motivate. You've got uh, Bob and Tom's mailboxes up here. And uh, there are three sort of tables that I have split up the mailbox database into. You have the metadata table, which are you know, uh, attributes about your email, like who was it from, what's the subject, uh, what was the date that it was sent, is it in the unread, fo uh, is it unread or read, is it in the, your inbox or is it in the sent folder, things like that. And then you have the message details table. This is more immutable. It's the content of the message. Once you write it, you never change it typically. And, uh, but you want full text search on that piece. And then there is the mailbox aggregates table, which you might want to maintain synchronously. Things like how many unread messages that Bob have and how many total messages does he have. So the, the green or the cyan over here is you know, showing one partition. So everything that has Bob falls into the hierarchy and it's in one partition. Everything that has Tom falls into a different hierarchy, and it's a, a different partition. So once you split it out, you've got partition one, which is all of Bob's stuff, and then partition two, which is all of Tom's stuff. And of course, it's not like one guy gets one partition, but it's, you know, it's just illustrative. You could have many other people co-located on the same partition. Uh, the kind of master-slave uh, style we follow is very sim similar to Bigtable or HBase, where given a single partition, there's, it's mastered on one node and then uh, replicated or slaved at other nodes. Uh, so in this case, there are three storage nodes. Node one, partition one is uh, mastered at node one and slaved at node two. Node three is master of partition nine, which is uh, uh, slaved at node one. So all reads and writes uh, go to the master, and then the slaves are there just for uh, durability and for failover. The API, uh, I'll just leave these slides up uh, for you to look at later. It's REST over HTTP. Uh, it's pretty easy to reason about gets and re make it readable. Uh, we also support transactions, so you can transactionally update you know, three different rows as long as they are across three different tables, as long as they're sort of within the same hierarchy. So system components, um, we have uh, a routing tier, which is uh, primarily an HTTP uh, processing tier, which given a request, figures out which uh, resource key or which partition it routes to and sends it down into the storage tier. On our storage nodes, we have a combination of MySQL and Lucene. We use MySQL primarily as a sort of durable primary storage um, and Lucene for secondary indexing and full text search. Uh, and then we have Databus uh, sitting uh, behind MySQL. And we do semi-sync replication so that uh, the write before it returns back has made it out to at least one more node. And that's sort of some of the things we are using from the MySQL community. Um, the other thing that's sort of sitting in the center on the side, but keeping track of everything that's going on, is the cluster manager. It is the one that's responsible for allocating partitions to nodes, uh, figuring out when nodes die, and being able to move partitions when they are uh, being able to move partitions in reaction to either failures or workload redistribution or things like that. So Espresso at LinkedIn, uh, we, we just launched an application uh, this, this month. It's a pretty new project. Uh, I think we've been coding for the last six months or so, and uh, we were in design for about three months before that. So company profiles, it's a small data set, but it's an interesting data model. It's hierarchical. It's company, and then products, and then reviews. So it's three-level hierarchies. 
Then there is InMail, which is a pretty large data set and has a similarly complex data model like what I was talking about. And uh, we're going to launch that uh, sometime uh, later this year and uh, next year as well. We've got many more uh, that are lined up, and we're uh, pretty excited. So next steps, uh, we're going to open source this uh, next year. So 2012, I think uh, we haven't finalized the exact dates. We're uh, looking very carefully at multi-data center support. Uh, Databus actually gives us a very easy way of doing that. Uh, we're looking at different uh, storage layouts because uh, InnoDB works well for, as uh, we, we all know, read-optimized uh, workloads. But uh, log structure stores, uh, we're looking at it for more write-heavy and uh, low-read uh, workloads. And we're also looking at uh, time partition data or data with a lot of temporal locality um, and being able to handle that well. So next play, uh, what we are realizing is, well, we went ahead and built a lot of infrastructure. These are all independent distributed systems that work well. But uh, after a point, you know, once you operate and run all these in production, you realize that each of them have their own quirks. You have to rebuild some of the uh, routing, the, some of the fault tolerance, the monitoring again and again. And we're trying to take a step back and see, well, can we abstract out the generic infrastructure that you need to build distributed systems and then only specialize on the components that you really uh, care about for a given workload or a given application? Um, so Helix is one of the first things that has happened as a result of that. It's a generic cluster manager for distributed data systems. We were quite successful in actually using it for both Espresso, Databus, and our new search platform. So we're excited about it. It's going to be open sourced about the same time as Espresso as well. Uh, it uses Zookeeper at the lower level, but overall it's a distributed state management uh, system. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk a lot in the next uh, few months, or uh, yeah, mostly months, about uh, innovation on uh, nearline processing or stream processing. The Espresso ecosystem will we'll probably come back uh, sometime later with learnings and figuring, figuring out, oh, MySQL and Lucene on a single box doesn't really work, things like that. Um, we're probably going to do some more announcements on uh, storage engines and uh, indexing uh, stores. And we're looking for convergence on building blocks for uh, distributed data management systems. Thank you for uh, listening. Uh, we're also hiring very aggressively in this area. <laughs> Um, so if you're interested in coming and working on uh, cool data stuff, uh, talk, talk to us. There are a bunch of us here. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.